the TARDIS, an international symbol of hopes and dreams, of adventures and misadventures, of good versus evil, and the unmistakable signature of a captivating television science fiction adventure series that nearly ran out of time in the first few weeks of its existence. Doctor Who was unveiled in Great Britain on November 23, 1963, the very day that news of President John F. Kennedy's assassination made headlines in Britain. When the London Times declared the shocking news, a small notation in the TV listings was understandably overlooked. Obscured by momentous world events, Doctor Who got off to a less than stellar start. BBC programmers had high hopes for Doctor Who. They were looking to create a new Saturday afternoon program that would interest sports fans and the growing teenage pop music audience, while at the same time appealing to children accustomed to traditional Saturday afternoon series. Sidney Newman, head of the BBC Drama Group, is credited with the deceptively simple concept, which was then amplified by Donald Wilson, BBC head of serials. But it fell to a young, bright, adventurous producer named Verity Lambert to put Doctor Who on the air. It was rather a sort of um, forgotten baby, to a certain extent, because the children's department didn't want to have anything to do with it, and were rather cross that, that it was being made by the drama department. And the people in the drama department, on the whole, felt that it was a children's show, and therefore, consequently, was beneath their uh, notice, apart from, of course, Sidney Newman and Donald Wilson, who, who had uh, had the idea to begin with. I mean, I, I, was, I think that I got the... The, the opportunity because I'd worked with Sydney at ABC Television as a production assistant and um, he, when he was thinking of somebody to do that particular series I think he wanted to try and, uh, and make it different and have somebody who perhaps hadn't uh, done anything before or at least had different ideas about how to produce things. And after the first one the BBC wanted to stop it they they completely lost confidence in it and um i think probably they would have done it, except that we we just couldn't at that point because we had a six part serial and that had to go in and then we had another seven parts but they couldn't stop it at 13. and as it so happened then the the second serial we did was the daleks and that it completely took off and from that moment on um it there was no talk of stopping it Arabic-speaking Daleks? You bet. The Doctor Who phenomenon spread to more than 54 countries. The cast, monsters and all, dubbed to native languages. The Daleks, like the show's central character, transcend the boundaries of language. It was a brilliant idea, really, almost. All you want is one sort of stunt man sitting inside, pedaling along on the floor <laughs> with a <coughs> hood over his head and a, a drain plunger. <laughs> It was a fantastic idea. It was so clever, it was so simple, lovely. The first time we saw them in Billy's uh, story of the Dalek City, it was marvellous. It was a wonderful thing. I mean, my reaction was the same as the rest of the population of, of, of Britain. It was uh, 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 absolutely intriguing and uh, very exciting form of alien life. This truly exciting form of alien life was born in the fertile imagination of writer Terry Nation, who, the story goes, only agreed to write for the embryonic Doctor Who series because you needed money to pay for a new central heating system in your London home. True or false? False. I certainly needed the money. I still do. Uh, but it wasn't about central heating. It was just money, I think. Before we touch base with the Daleks and, and pick up with that story, let's reconstruct the atmosphere in which Doctor Who was created. We could actually go back in time and have a look, but we still haven't quite perfected our physical means of time travel here. Where do we begin? The autumn of 1962. You're sitting in the lonely writer's garret, as they say, writing for four principal characters, the doctor, played by the late William Hartnell, Barbara and Ian, two school teachers, played by Jacqueline Hill and William Russell, and the doctor's granddaughter, Susan, played by a very young, bright actress named Carol Ann Ford. What was the situation? Well, that does take me back. Uh, I wish I could tell you that it was, there was a feeling of momentousness or of something special happening. The truth of the matter, no, it wasn't like that. It was a job of work. I was writing seven episodes and believing that it had no hope, that it was a no hope. But this was a show that what we used to call this kind of show, take the money and fly like a thief. And so I sat down and I wrote those seven episodes, one a day. I wrote each episode in a day because I was going on to do something else. So the atmosphere was not exciting at that point. Uh, it was a little later that began. Now, it's, it's said that one of the reasons why script editor David Whitaker was so enthralled with the Dalek story 
was that it was um, a morality play steeped in mythology and, and history. Uh, what were you looking for when, when you came into that? Uh, morality, play, and mythology, they're all fairly pompous words. The truth of the matter was, I was looking, set me good and evil were part of it. They're good guys and bad guys. Uh, I was looking for a tremendous adventure yarn. I wanted a, a really exciting thing, remembering the things that had excited me as a young man, the kind of movies and the serials that had excited me. That's what I was looking for. And uh, I had this wonderful freedom to do it. I was allowed to do it. So I had a strong driving narrative of story with lots of people in danger. It is only in retrospect that you could perhaps see those things in moral terms. Were the Daleks going to wipe out entirely a race that would put up no kind of fight? Was this the Jews and the Germans? Those things, I think, came later. I'm not sure I was aware of them at that time. Now, when you initially got involved in writing for the series, they were going to be as I understand it, kind of alternating between historical and science yeah. fiction. How did you, you come to land the science fiction of the stories? I, I think there was, there was a great shortage of science fiction writers, and I had done one show for something. Uh, then, what happened? Oh, yeah, well, they called me in. And as one of the, I, I said I'd like to do the seven episodes of science fiction. But by that time, the, the aim was really to do historical, good, educational things. And nobody at BBC, except Verity Lambert and David Whittaker, nobody liked the Dalek scripts. Having taken on the task of writing for the Fledgling series, how did you come up with something as um, frighteningly relevant as the Daleks? This was years before Three Mile Island and, and Chernobyl. Um, were you so terrified of the possible consequences of, of nuclear technology? Well, I think since Hiroshima, the world had been terrified of nuclear technology. And a lot of science fiction writers had investigated that possibility. Well, with the Daleks, I wanted to take it to the ultimate point where we had mutated to such an awful degree. When it came to the idea of the Daleks, it really came back to my going to movies as a kid and looking at monster movies and being frightened, but always knowing, somehow knowing there was a man dressed up there. And so when I came to put my monsters in, the first thing I did was to take the legs away. Then it wasn't a man dressed up after that. The rest of it sort of came naturally, but I really had to take the legs away so it wasn't a man dressed up. Now, Ed, however you saw this in your head, you, when you put it down on paper, you were very vague. I believe you described them in terms of hideous machine-like creatures. They, they legless, right. moving on a round base. They have no human features. Uh, lens on a flexible shaft, acts as an eye arms with mechanical grips for hands, stuff like Are that. Are you ever going to forget the phraseology of I that? I think I'll have to live with it forever. Now, it fell to your colleague at the BBC, designer Ray Cusick, to actually put this nuclear nightmare in, into existence. Did, did you have a conversation about this? How did that transpire? Oh, we met, but uh, having that description, uh, he went away, and my God, he did such a wonderful job. I mean, I'm eternally grateful to the man because he did such a brilliant job. And... Uh, only he knows how he did it. Now, while only Ray Cusick can say what was going on in his mind, to the best of your recollections, what was Ray looking to do when he translated your vision? Well, as I understand it, he sat a long time in the canteen at BBC, worrying, because they were going to be tough to make these things, and was inspired by the salt and pepper shakers. Uh, whether that's true or... I don't know. But I know that he ran into huge financial problems. To build them was expensive. And basically the BBC, or the hierarchy of BBC, didn't want these science fiction monsters, so they were against it too. So I think he was fighting a lot of very tough battles. When I went to see them for the very first time, I said, oh yeah, that's a Dalek, and it was wonderful. So he had done a great job. When the Daleks was first broadcast in December of 1963, the first person to encounter your creation was a brilliant young actress named Carol Ann Ford. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about Carol. She was the, uh, the Fay Ray of Doctor Who. She screamed wonderfully well, looked terrified at all times, and ran. And uh, so I guess she represented, as far as I was concerned, the kids who were watching. They were supposed to see the sh show through her eyes. And she did it wonderfully well. She was a pretty kid and, and tough and kept going through a long series. Now, she set the precedent, I suppose, for Doctor Who assistance when she left the series about a quarter of the way through the second season. She went on to chalk up numerous credits in television, film, and theater, and spend time and have a family. 
Doctor Who, though, was her first exposure to the incredible power of television, and she looks back on the experience with understandable pride and just a touch of wonder. It wasn't the great explosive excitement deal that it is now, because for us it was just another television program. We had no idea it was going to take off like it did. No idea at all. It took us by surprise, took everyone by surprise. We were going to do eight episodes, and that was it. And suddenly we had, we were overnight successes. I mean, everybody knew us. You couldn't go anywhere without being mobbed. <laughs> Incredible. When did you first begin to feel that the, the program had a long-term possibility? Oh, when the first Dalek came on. Yes, the reaction from the first Daleks. Oh, amazing. Um, I mean, I'd never been involved in anything like this. I mean, I was a, a jobbing actor and very happy to play many different kinds of roles and never to be identified with any one particular kind of part. And uh, so therefore, I'd not had anything like the reaction I had with this, with not being able to, I mean, the, the old chestnut of not being mm -hmm. able to go to a supermarket you know, without being mobbed. Extraordinary, quite extraordinary. What was your reaction to the Daleks at first? Did you, did they you think... They were hysterically funny. Well, I was going to say, did you think that they would be, the, uh, the dramatics people were going to be able to turn these cans into fearsome beings? Nope. <laughs> we called them pepper pots, so we used to ride in them. <laughs> but uh, the fact is, they came across obviously very frightening. As soon as they were on, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing little boys going, exterminate, exterminate, exterminate. You will move ahead of us and follow my directions. It may have been this the voice. Way. It may have been this wonderful subhuman, non-human voice. It may have been the fact that, um, in a way, they were easy to imitate. I mean, you know, I suppose one could be horrifically sort of... Um, sociologically and psychologically minded and, and say, um, I've never, it's, this has never occurred to me before, but when you think of the mass hysteria engendered by Hitler and the salute, what a very easy thing for everybody to do. I mean, here you had the Daleks. You know, it's the first time it's occurred to me, quite frankly, but it's a possibility. It's a sort of hysterical thing, you know, it's, it's very strong. It's a very strong image, there's no doubt about that. And, uh, in the beginning, it was impossible to annihilate them. And there's nothing, there was nothing else like it. And we had no other science fiction programs. We hadn't yet been invaded by Star Wars. And uh, it wasn't just the Daleks. It was the, the fact that there was nothing this program couldn't do. I mean, here were endless possibilities. And we kept on telling them the endless things that we can do. Was it frustrating for you as an actress to play the kind of part that um, you were being asked to play? More frustrating than you can possibly know, because when I was first approached to play this part, I was told, I don't know if you're familiar with a series called The Avengers. Certainly. Right? And there was another series at the time called A for Andromeda. Mm -hmm. You know that one? Mm -hmm. I was told that this child was going to be a combination, she was 15, she was going to be a combination of the physical aspects of the Avengers woman. So therefore, there was nothing physically she couldn't do and the mental aspects of Andromeda. In other words, she was going to have telepathic communication with her grandfather and indeed some of the monsters that we were to encounter. She was going to have super, super intelligence. She was going to be able to do anything scientifically that the doctor could do, in some cases more so because she was the next generation. They lied to you. They did, didn't they? <laughs> All that, and the clothing too was going to be superb. We went through fashion plate after fashion plate and and I was told this designer that, well, we all know what happened, don't we? <laughs> what was it like back in that particular era doing a show like Doctor Who? Um, it was by Hectic. and large live. Mm. Um, they, there was not the kind of technology that there mm. is today. It was very, very hectic. We had a very tight schedule. On Monday, we had the script come in. Uh, we didn't very often get the scripts before we actually had our first day of rehearsal. And there were actually times when we were sitting there uh, waiting for each page to come in. So if we were lucky, we managed to get through the first script reading on the Monday. Uh, we then, of course, had to raise various uh, points uh, as far as the scripts were concerned, because unfortunately, a lot of the script writers did not watch previous episodes, or if they did, they didn't watch them very carefully. 
And there were many occasions when we had to say, look, you cannot put this, because last week she did and said this, and so therefore this doesn't follow, etc. Um, on the Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, we had a run. Uh, no, we didn't have a run. We had a plotting session. In other words, moving from A to B on various lines. On Wednesday, we had a run already. On Thursday, we had the camera crew in there, the technical crew. On Friday, we were in the television studios. So it was terrifying. <laughs> oh, oh, Bill was, was marvelous. He was wonderful, but he had a very complex sort of personality. Um, he had a very grand paternalistic sort of feeling towards me and felt that I needed protecting in many ways. And uh, I think he forgot that I was actually playing a 15-year-old, but I was in my early 20s. And he used to get very concerned that I was spending my money on frivolous things like clothes, which I love, and champagne, which I love. And he'd say to me, now, come on, you know, you've got to put some of this money to one side. You never know when you'll be out of work. I mean, this may not last forever. Mm -hmm. So I got a little bit fed up with this and said, look, Bill, it is my money. I really think I should be allowed to spend it as I would like to spend it. And uh, he sort of went, <coughs> and sort of turned away and spoke to somebody else. And I thought, oh, dear, I've offended him again. Mm. <laughs> the next day, he came into rehearsal with a great Jeroboam of champagne for me. <laughs> and that was Bill. I mean, you know, he was, he was a sweet, lovely man. He really was. Let's go back to this point that Carol Ann raised initially. Uh, she was supposed to have these extraterrestrial superpowers. As one who was privy to script editor David Whitaker's writer's briefing book, what happened? Uh, so far as I know, there was, never was a writer's briefing book. I talked to David Whitaker. Maybe later in the series, there had to be a Bible to say what had, what had gone on. But I guess when you're hiring the performers, promise them anything, and they can just hope they're going to get it. What we really needed was, were functionaries. Uh, we needed a kid to be chased. We needed a good physical presence, which we had in Ian, and the solid, sensible lady in Barbara. And those were the only characteristics, I think, that I needed to use at that point. So whatever the producers had promised her, they lied. And the um, doctor's characteristics, too, were very, very important. Well, his were more clear-cut, I think, than, than any of the others. Uh, because there was a lot of Bill Hartnell in there. He was a slightly crotchety actor. And he played the old slightly absent-minded professor and then bad-tempered at all times, and yet heart of gold and all of those things. That was easier. Uh, they, they seem to fall into place on Bill's shoulders very easily, but the other characters we had to play with. And I think the story got bigger than the characters, ultimately. Our story gets a little bit bigger, too. When we return more with Terry Nation, a few special moments with the late Patrick Troughton, and your introduction to Doctor Number 7, Sylvester McCoy, when Doctor Who Then and Now continues. <laughs> Welcome back to Doctor Who Then and Now. Our special guest, of course, is Mr. Terry Nation, creator of the Daleks and part of the original Doctor Who production team. Among Terry's numerous British TV credits are The Saint, on which he was principal writer, and The Avengers, where he served as script editor and writer. He also found the time to create and write several other series, including Survivors and Blake Seven, before packing off for Los Angeles in September of 1979. I believe you described that period of your life as a middle-aged man's last fling at adventure, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. It's uh, packing up the kids and the family and putting them on a plane and pretending it was going to be for three months. Well, <laughs> it's been seven years now. Since moving to America, Terry has had a series of adventures writing for the three major networks and HBO and feature films and several novels as well. But of all Terry's accomplishments, I guess Doctor Who is especially rewarding because it allows viewers to participate on so many different levels. Most fans are content to draw the line at regular viewing. For others, Doctor Who involvement extends to fan club participation. Now, we thought it would be fun and somewhat different to let Doctor Who fans have the interviewer's hot seat. So we managed to finesse our way into a glitzy Gallifreyan New Year's party thrown by the Jersey Jaggeroff, an enthusiastic Doctor Who fan club. The people you're about to meet are real, and each falls at a different point along a personal continuum of Doctor Who fandom. You all set? I'm ready. Okay, the first question comes from someone you'll probably recognize. You've stated how impressed you were with Raymond Cusick's design of the Daleks. I'm just curious as to whether or not the first time you saw them, whether you thought that the voices they were given were adequate to their characters. <laughs> That's a wonderful voice. 
Uh, the first time I saw them was in a car park at the BBC, so they didn't have voices. I heard the voice for the first time on air, along with the rest of Britain, and yeah, I thought they were wonderful. I thought they were a sensational voice, and my wife, on whose voice I based the Daleks, she talks like that all that time, she thought they were wonderful too. Thank you for the question. First of all, will uh, there be uh, novelizations of Resurrection of the Daleks and Revelation of the Daleks? And also, when you wrote Genesis of the Daleks, you uh, messed up the continuity which was uh, formed by the earlier Dalek stories. Are you ever going to, uh, say, write a story which tries to join the two continuities together? All right. You asked two questions. Uh, yeah, I guess they will do novelizations of those books if we can ever come to the right financial terms. I think that's what's going on with those. Now, I don't agree with you. I didn't mess up on anything. I didn't mess up the continuity. I simply saw history from another perspective. This was facts that had come into my possession, and I wanted to put things straight. So Genesis of the Daleks was the new look with the new information. Interesting question, and thank you for it. One of my favorite characters from Doctor Who has been Davros, the maniacal creator of the Daleks. I was wondering, what inspired you to, to make such a character? Davros happens to be one of my favorite characters, too. I'm really crazy about him. I think what I wanted to do was to be able to say more about the Daleks. You know, they, are, they can be very boring creatures. If you listen to a Dalek do anything on the long range, a lot of words, then they're incredibly boring. So I wanted to find a way to give the Daleks a spokesperson, and Davros was the perfect example, and he seemed to be halfway between human and the thing that the Dalek ultimately became. Therefore, he was my, my spokesman, my, my symbol, and my favorite. Again, that's a nice question, and thank you. You've written stories for each of the first four doctors, William Hartnell, Patrick Troughton, John Pertwee, and Tom Baker. Could you tell us how you altered your writing style for each of those four doctors? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, yeah, I think first and foremost, you, or I anyway, made the story work. And the doctor would be fairly straightforward. He would be a functionary of the story. Then as I saw how the particular actor was treating the piece, I would adapt and give him new pieces to do, and hopefully he would give us new pieces too, and so it was a constant interchange. And with Bill Hartnell, it was fairly easy. We knew exactly who he was, and he gave us a great deal. But as new doctors came along, we had to find out what their talents were, what their little foibles were. And so we adapted, and it was a constant trade-off. The actor would give us something, the writer would improve on it, and so on. So my way of handling it was simply to let it evolve, I think. Thank you. Uh, Terry, you've worked extensively in British television on such shows as Doctor Who and also on American television on shows such as MacGyver. Could you please uh, give us some of your experiences and compare working in the British and American television industries? Yeah, that's, that's a tough question. I think I was tremendously privileged when I was working for the BBC. Once they had given me a series, I was very much left alone to do what I wanted. Uh, particularly thinking of a couple of series like Survivors or Blake Seven. I just went away and wrote the series, and I didn't have many masters. I had a producer I would talk to, and I had a script editor and directors, but very much on my own. With the American companies I've worked with, I have so many masters. You will have the studio and several people in the studio. You will have the network. You will have the producers. You will have the actors, all of them aiming to achieve different things. And so you are set upon by a great many people. And I find that disturbing, and I found it not very helpful to the creative process. And so I think I would say the difference is it is nicer and easier in Britain to do a television show, very tough in America, but then you have to see what the rewards are. And the rewards in the United States for that toughness can be enormous. They can be very, very good indeed, and in Britain, less good. Thanks for the question. Do you plan to return to the show in the near future? I'll never say never again, uh, but I don't have any plans right now to do so. If they asked me and we were going to do one more Dalek show, perhaps, yeah, I think I would be terribly tempted to let the Daleks do one more shot. But right now, no. 
Okay, I have been asked to ask if there are any plans to market Dalek salt and pepper shakers. <laughs> um, I'm sure somebody must have. You know, when they first hit their peak in Britain, there were Dalek everything from Dalek slippers, Dalek wallpaper. Can you imagine some kid having to live in a room with Dalek wallpaper? All sorts of things, chocolate ice creams. So I'm quite convinced there were salt and pepper shakers made like Daleks. And I'll bet if I looked through my memorabilia, I'd find some. Now, with, with the Daleks, creatures without legs, they said it couldn't be done. But you knew it could be done because you had seen something that reinforced that in your, in your mind. Right. It, it was a terrifically exciting performance by the Georgian State Dancers, Georgian State Ballet, that had been in London. And one of the dances was done by the girls in peasant costumes. And they wore very straight, long skirts, skirts that actually touched the ground. And they evidently moved with very tiny steps because they just glided across the stage. And you never saw movement, never saw leg movement, you never saw anything. And that convinced me we could do it, and that was the way it ought to look when we finished. And indeed, thanks to the Georgian State Dancers, we got the Daleks doing that. When Terry Nation was selected to be the scriptwriter for the Dalek story, the BBC didn't know it, but they were effectively changing the entire scope and direction of the Doctor Who series, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, I believe so. This may be in dispute, but I think what happened was that the Daleks took off with such strength that instead of the show going on and being slightly historical and slightly educational, we became a science fiction show, a futurist show, essentially. And this made a big difference to the characters who played in it because had they been observers of history, they would not have been the main, the main stem. They would not have pushed the stories forward. As it was, they went forward and adventured into new worlds and new situations, and it changed, they became the catalysts for the stories. So I believe that, yes, it changed everything, and despite the fact that they never wanted to have a science fiction show on their hands, they couldn't ignore the hit we were. You said that you thought the show was going to last 13 weeks and you were going to take the money and off you'd go. When did this stop being a job to you? When did it start to take on the feeling in your mind that, hey, this is, this is something that, that's fun? Well, more than that, it was my recognition that we had a hit on our hands. You see, as a writer, your name goes out into millions of homes, but you remain anonymous. The, the, the credits go up and nobody reads those because they're all off making tea by that time. After the second week of the Daleks and Doctor Who, I started getting mail. Not little mail, I mean 10, 20 letters directly to me. More were coming to BBC. By the third week, the post office were bringing me bagfuls of letters, and they were addressed to Terry Nation, Dalek Man, London. Now the ma mail was pouring in, and by the end of the show, they were sending it around in vans. I mean, a van load of mail. Now, I'm not so stupid. I may look that way, but I'm not that dumb. I thought, hey, we're onto something good here. We've got a hit. Let me amplify that, that question. When, when you talk about Daleks today, there's a little spark in your eye. They're, mm -hmm. they're as real as your children are. When did you begin to feel that you knew those Daleks? Oh, I knew them from the off. I mean, they were born in my head, and I did know them like children as they developed. I knew them, and I swear I know them better than any other writer right now. I know that I've lived with them this long, and I know exactly what they can do, what they can't do, how they think, how they act. Yeah, I know them deeply. Doctor Who is a show about time and space. Let's play a little game here. Terry Nation actually meets Davros and the Daleks. What would happen? Oh, well, they're my friends. I'd just go in and we'd have a drink and uh, exterminate the rest of the world, I think. No, I love those guys. Well, what do you think of the idea of the, uh, the fan club interviews? Oh, that's Nice touch. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Good. One of the questions, though, raised a point which, which I'd like to clear up. You didn't actually write for Pat Troughton, did you? No, no, I didn't. But I knew him reasonably well. And, of course, Pat had... He was the big guinea pig. He was the first of the new doctors. And nobody knew how that was going to work. Nobody knew whether that was going... The audience would accept that the old doctor went in one end and out came a brand-new actor at the other end and took on these whole new set of characteristics. So I think it says much for his memory and his skill as an actor that he made that possible and then went on through so many doctors. What it also pointed out was that actors have to be very careful. When they get difficult, they get sent inside and out comes another actor. 
Now, the Patrick Trout in years represented a great leap forward in the program's popularity. But as Pat was the first one to admit, the public's acceptance of the doctor's ability to regenerate was by no means certain. Well, it was sort of touch and go a bit, really. Although I, I um, oh, once I'd made up my mind what I was going to do with it, um, uh, and re rehearsed it for, I think we had a bit of a longer rehearsal with the first one, which was very nice of them. Uh, after that, um, I had committed myself, and so I was in it, and that was that. Uh, <coughs> and I didn't really care very much uh, what the uh, reaction was, but it was pleasant, uh, as a matter of fact, because after, the, uh, after a couple of days, I went up to the uh, BBC club, and a very old uh, colleague of mine who used to direct and produce a lot of the sort of classical things that I used to do, Dickens and so on. Uh, <coughs> he, um, he had a lovely voice like this. He, he said, um, very good, he said, good for another three years. So from that moment, I thought that, that would be very good. On the other hand, the, I think it was the director of plays, Andy Osborne said, the hat will have to go, he said. <laughs> My portrayal of it uh, caught on. Uh, that was the first reason. And I began to enjoy it very much indeed. And the script writers began to write for me instead of writing a script which I had to adapt to my own uh, performance. And all those things helped. And we got a good reaction coming back from all the families in England. And, you know, after a, uh, about a year, it was established, and um, it was a very uh, sort of a happy situation for me, really. <clears throat> the story behind the sonic screwdriver and some of the other innovations that stayed around. Yeah, uh, I'm not quite clear uh, about the significance of that, but I believe some of the other doctors, uh, John uh, Per 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 Twit, Per Twit, John Per Twit, Pert, him anyway, the one who took over for me. Um, he always claimed, I think, that he invented that. It's a load of rubbish. He didn't invent it at all. It was something I picked up off the prop table. You know, we had all sorts of props on the prop table, and my pockets were always bulging with all sorts of things which I used to bring out at odd moments, usually when I've forgotten my words or something. Look, look, I can prove to you that we come from another time. This is a sonic screwdriver. Now, where can I demonstrate? Uh, ah, that revolver will do. It's all right. There we are, and back it goes. Fantastic! Do you believe me now? I don't think it's a particularly uh, ingenious uh, uh, thing, really, implement, just to unscrew a screw. Well, certainly it's a rather simple thing for a Time Lord to be able to... Yeah, do, but you right? see, oh, you, you, well, you be careful there, you see, because Time Lords, when especially me, my Time Lord, uh, my um, aspect, the personality, he used to um, he used to use the tools that were to hand. If he was visiting the Earth, there was no point in him uh, using all his great knowledge of electronics and sonics and all the rest of it, um, because that would have been too easy, you see. It's much more fun if you're fighting Indians to fight them with bows and arrows, see what I mean, that sort of thing. Otherwise, you're going to win all the time, you know, s too quickly. And there's no fun in that. You want to sort of spread it out a bit. We used to try and put things in, Fraser and I and Wendy, which um, <coughs> weren't in the script. And um, outrageous things, you know, which we thought we might get away with. So what we used to do was to, um, we'd slip them in, but we'd cover them by also slipping in something far more outrageous, which we knew they'd cut, which we knew they'd object to, you see. And so... Um, Whenever the producer's run came, which was the last uh, run of the rehearsal, and he came and vetted the whole thing with his little notebook, you know. Um, whenever he came there and gave his notes, we made sure there was something which he, we knew he was going to object to, and then he might sort of miss the ones that we'd slipped in. Great jumping gobstoppers, what's that? The Crotons command. It means there is a message for me. Oh, what does it say? Huh? Class 3197, selected female... Zogon. Zogon? Zoe! They mean you! They have chosen you as a companion. And we all know what happens to them, don't we? Well, Doctor, what shall I do? Well, she doesn't have to go, does she? 
Well, does she or doesn't she? I'm afraid she must. Complete obedience is the Croton's first command. And if we fail to obey... They'll destroy you, I see. Oh, dear. Now do you see what you've done? Fooling around with this stupid machine. But I'm not a dog. But the machine doesn't know that. Oh, where are you going? I'm going to take the test. I can't let you go in there alone. Uh, what do I do? Well, sit down. Uh, and put this... Oh, this headset on. And press the button. Press the button. All right, there's no need to shout. Now go away and don't fuss me. Now come back, what's this? It's oh, all right, I know. Uh, right, fire away, I'm ready. Because the three docks and the five docks and the two doctors, that wasn't really my original doctor. That was me trying to recreate what I remembered of 20 years ago, you know, and looking at um, those old ones. Well, he was younger and he was quicker and it was uh, rather better, I think. <laughs> the late Patrick Troughton, Doctor Number Two. When we return, you'll meet Sylvester McCoy and Bonnie Langford, a doctor companion duo that continues the best traditions of Doctor Who. Each generation has to find something new in the show and uh, it's going through a process of regeneration now. It's been on the air 23 years, uh, and that takes time. And as soon as we've got it exactly how we want it, then we can step the number of episodes up if it's working well. If it's not working well, will you uh, make arrangements and try to make it work well? I yes, assume. indeed. Yes. No, we we will, we won't give up on the show. You know? I mean, I'm making it sound as if it's if it's dying on its feet. It certainly isn't. Uh, but the show's been running 23 years. You have to protect, and you have to give new audiences new reasons to watch the show, and uh, that's what we're trying to do. BBC controller Michael Grade, with whom I spoke in Washington, D.C. back in May of 1986. Joining me in the studio for this section of the program is science fiction journalist Patrick Daniel O'Neill. Now, Pat, who better to serve as a catalyst for a discussion of the Doctor Who of today than Michael Grade, the man who decided to put Doctor Who on hiatus for a year? Now, to his credit, he did, in fact, bring the series back. Well, yes, he did, but in a very truncated form, only 14 episodes per season, and that appears to be the norm from now on. A lot of fans aren't happy about that. Now, it really wouldn't be fair to put Terry on the spot by asking him to comment on the direction that the series has taken, but we can put Pat O'Neill on the spot. So, Mr. O'Neill, where is Doctor Who now, and where is Doctor Who going? As Michael Grade says, the series is in a state of flux, introducing its third leading actor in just over three years, and facing scrutiny from the higher echelons within the BBC. Does this put Doctor Who in jeopardy? As casting developments would indicate, it certainly puts the show's actors in jeopardy. Since Mr. Gray's remarks in Washington, a seventh doctor, Sylvester McCoy, has entered the series with a BBC-declared three-year limit placed on the doctor's board certification. McCoy's episodes hit the air at a time when competition for the free time of the British audience has never been greater. VCR penetration in Britain tops 50%, and commercial TV is an established alternative to BBC programming. Those options didn't exist in the early and mid-1960s when the unusual storylines and characters of Doctor Who were a particularly big draw. Now, with big-budget films available for broadcast and home VCR rental, Doctor Who must become even more daring and original in order to compete. On the other hand, in Britain, Doctor Who is an institution. The show's ratings remain respectable, and it is a continuing source of revenue for the Beeb through overseas sales. It is the eagerly awaited new episodes that keep many long-time viewers tuned in. The American audience, at least, might lose their enthusiasm without new material in the pipeline. How best can Doctor Who compete for the attention of the British audience and beyond? In recent years, the number of stories that take place in Earth's past have been severely limited. The clear emphasis on outer space adventures places Doctor Who in direct competition in terms of set design and special effects, with bigger budget TV and theatrical films. Perhaps the series needs a return to its roots. Time travel, not space travel. The next companion after Melanie, or perhaps alongside Mel, should be from Earth's past. Maybe a soldier from the Napoleonic era, or a medieval peasant. On this side of the Atlantic, Doctor Who appears to be in fine shape. Fans remain loyal to the show, generously supporting the public television stations that schedule it. Yet, Doctor Who fandom is unlikely to grow at any outstanding rate. It is, after all, an acquired taste. Those of us who have followed the series since its first appearance on these shores can think of ourselves like those who first recognized the work of Picasso or Pollock. 
we're simply ahead of our time. And isn't that, after all, rather a fitting description for the followers of a Time Lord? Now, Pat, key to the success of Doctor Who, in addition to the storyline, are the portrayals of the Doctor and his companion. Now, in Companion Melanie Bush, producer John Nathan Turner and his staff have selected a dynamo, actress Bonnie Lankford, whom you'll meet in just a few moments. Now, in your opinion, how has the direction of the Companions gone in, in, uh, in Doctor Who? Is it moving in a positive direction, or is it not moving in a positive direction? I think it's a little of both. Positively, Companions today are much smarter, much brighter, much more effective as characters than they were even back in Pertwee's era when we had, you know, the classic screamers like, uh, like Katie Manning as Joe Grant. The problem today is that they've gotten so strong that they no longer complement the Doctor. Um, I'm sorry, I find it particularly capable in Colin Baker and Nicola Bryant. I like Nicola as a person. I like, partly like Perry as a companion. But they clash with each other so strongly that, there's, that they almost stop the story from moving forward. Now, clearly, one way that Mr. Grade can attract his new audience is by showcasing attractive talent and young talent like Bonnie Langford. Now, she left fairy dust in Never Never Land behind for a stint on the TARDIS and every land imaginable. But I was appearing in Peter Pan in London, um, the musical, and uh, uh, John Nathan Turner was speaking to my agent and asked, via my agent if I could go and meet John and chat to him. So I did, not really knowing what it was all about, in fact. And uh, I went along and he presented me with this sheet of paper about a character analysis of this character called Melanie. And I read it and said, that's nice, <laughs> not <laughs> lovely. And he said, would you like to do the show? Uh, which I said, well, I'm sure it would be a super thing to do, yes, super. I, then I went shooting off to open in London, in fact. I'd come from the breakfast morning show, so I was totally dazed by everything. And um, I didn't really think about it again until about, oh, a month or so later when I had this panic phone call from John saying, they're having to set up a press call tomorrow. And I said, what for? <laughs> he said, Doctor Who, you're doing it. Had you been a, a fan of Doctor Who growing up? Well, in fact, when I was very little, uh, I was too scared to watch it. It was one of those sort of, and by the time I was, I was old enough to not be too scared to watch it, I was doing shows. And uh, uh, it was always on on a Saturday, nearly always on on a Saturday. And that's when I would be doing a matinee or an evening performance of, of whichever show I was in. And I just didn't ever sort of really get, get into it. I have seen about three or four of the programs now. But in fact, they say that it's probably better if I don't see any of them. Because then I'll put a totally new and fresh approach, whether anybody will like that. <laughs> I'm sure they will. I I'm hope sure they so. Will. I do hope now, you're, so. You started in the business uh, very young, right? Mm, I've been in it over 13 years now. From a showbiz family? Um, not really, although, well, I suppose so. My, uh, my sisters are both dancers. Um, my, both of them went to the Royal Ballet School. Uh, one of them at the moment is in Cats in London, which is nice because I was in it five years ago when it opened, and now she's in it playing the white cat, so we still have a family interest in that show. <laughs> I think it might run long enough for my nieces to go in there as well. Um, and my middle sister, uh, she also went to, to the Royal Ballet School, so dancing was very much in my family. Um, I went to my mother's dancing school, she had a dancing school, and from there, a friend of ours who was involved with those dancing school shows, uh, which we did for a very big um, mental hospital uh, locally. Um, a friend of ours suggested that I go on a talent program called Opportunity Knock. Now, my parents weren't particularly thrilled about that idea. And, uh, you know, they thought, oh, it's all right for a child to train as a dancer or an actress or whatever, but to actually go on into these things might not be too good of an idea. But they couldn't really stop me once I got started because I was presented with such wonderful opportunities. Um, and when I was seven years old, I was on the Theatre Royal Drury Lane stage in Gone with the Wind. Um, it, you know, it's something very special and, and wonderful. Then I went into Gypsy in London with Angela Lansbury, the musical, and I was asked from that to come to America and do the show in America on a nine-month tour with six months on Broadway. And it was sort of like a dream, and it was, it was in a way too good to, to miss. And uh, they went through all these amazing uh, legal things to get permission for me to come over here, and they, they got it. So it sort of seemed like fate 
But it, if I'd turned around and said, oh, no, or if my parents had turned around and said, no, we won't let her, they also felt that then I'd turn around when I was 16 and say, if only I'd gone to America, I wouldn't be out of work now. Tell us about your character in Doctor Who. Well, her name is Melanie Bush, and she comes from Pea's Pottage in Sussex in England. And um, she's from 1986. She's a, very much a health and fitness expert. And I think that's basically been put in because Doctor Who has rather expanded over, over since the last season. He's got rather large around his middle, and I think they're trying to make him exercise it all. Carrot juice. It'll do you good. Honestly, carrots are full of vitamin A. Mel, have you studied my ears lately? It's your waistline I'm concerned about. No, no. Seriously, though. Is it my imagination, or have they started to grow longer? Listen, when I start to call you Neddy, then you can worry. Drink up. You'll worry sooner when I start to bray. Melanie is quite independent, so there are times when she wanders off and maybe gets into trouble, or maybe um, she in fact leads the doctor uh, into solving whatever problems there are a little bit sooner. Uh, she, she's very, very enthusiastic, which means she's always pushing the doctor on, saying, you know, come on, why don't we go and do this? And surely if we did that, she jumps to conclusions a little bit too fast. But she's quite, um, she's a computer programmer, so she's obviously quite ginned up on the way the TARDIS runs, so she's not, she's not too vague, I think. Although I don't know anything about computers, so I'm going to have to do a lot of homework on that. But, um, I think she knows who's boss as well. Bonnie raises a very interesting point. Should the doctor be the boss? On a very strong level, yes. He has to be the driving force in the show, the central character. On the other hand, the companion ought to be a character who can effectively say no in the course of a story because that can drive the story in an interesting direction. Speaking of interesting directions, just how bossy will the new doctor be? Only time will tell. I suppose that's ultimately for each and every fan to judge. Now, Sylvester McCoy brings to the role of Doctor a wide and varied background in television, film, and theater. He's particularly fond of clowns and comedy. Among his favorite stage roles are Stan Laurel and Festy in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. His versatility is indeed frightening, from werewolf to Renfeld. McCoy certainly knows how to set the stage alight. I heard it on the BBC News that the old Doctor was leaving. So I immediately got in touch with my agent, and he phoned up uh, John Nathan Turner. And uh, then I had a couple of interviews with John Nathan Turner, then an interview with the head of drama, then an interview with the head of series. Then I had a, um, a screen test, and they still asked me to do it. <laughs> well, my family are delighted. My two sons are um, over the moon. My youngest son, who's nine, said, I could we live on a hill? And he said that he was going to go to school and tell everybody that the new doctor had uh, moved onto our hill. <laughs> and they go say, oh, yes, where? And they said, you know, give her the our address. And they all say, oh God, yes, can I come and see him? And then they're gonna suddenly say, wait a minute, that's where you live. He said, yeah, the new doctor's my dad. <laughs> he was delighted, so they all were. Um, you asked me another question yeah, before how, that. Have you been a fan of the series? Of fan, that? yes. I, I was, um, I started watching it from the second doctor onwards, and when I was about 20, and I used to watch it every Saturday. It was, um, it was a special day to come down and watch Doctor Who. And then when, when I became a, do uh, a, a doctor, I nearly said, <laughs> I am a doctor now. When I became an actor, um, then life got difficult as far as watching serials were concerned. And so I gave that up because tended to, because the lifestyle, you tended never to see the end of anything. So I didn't really see the last two, except for fleeting little odd half hours here and there. But I'm a fan. I, I used to work in the city of London in reinsurance, you know, kind of briefcases and bowler hats and all those chappies. And uh, thank goodness my uh, company went bust, and I ended up looking for another job. And it was the, you know, the center of the hippie era. And um, I knew the cook in the roundhouse, which was the center of hippiedom in Britain, where everyone, everything, pop concerts happened there and all the avant-garde theater. And because um, I knew the cook, I got the job in the box office, because I was a hippie who could count. I had long hair down to here and beard and stash, dangly bits. The lot, beads, beads man. And um, I used to sell tickets. And uh, at the same time, there was an actor, an older actor who worked when he was not, when he was out of work, collecting my, the tickets I sold. And we used to loon around together and he presumed I was an actor. And I didn't tell him I was, nor did I tell him I wasn't. 
And then one day, another uh, quite famous director in Britain came in, and he was setting up, I think, called the Ken Campbell Roadshow, and he wanted, he told Brian, this collector of tickets, that he was after a really madman, because this was a mad show he was setting up. Brian said, well, that's the guy in the box office. He's completely out of his head. And he came up to me and said, do you want to be an actor? So I said, yes, and I did. And I went off and became an actor. My first job was in a prison, strange ways they call it, in Liverpool. My first performance. Oh, that sort of job. <laughs> yes, they let me out. I'm glad after. you clarified that. <laughs> now, well, Captive audience. Yes. It's great. Well, you were at the Roundhouse. You had uh, some other duties in addition to uh, collecting. Oh, yes, I was a part-time bouncer for the Rolling Stones. <laughs> On the Sundays, they used to have, have concerts, and uh, the, the Stones were doing the, nas the national tour before they came to America. And uh, I was asked to stand on the stage and keep any um, th fans who might get carried away off the stage. But in fact, like, no one could get out of the auditorium. They were so crammed that the front, everyone was stuck like sardines. It was amazing standing out there. People just couldn't move. They just kind of bounce about like that at the front. And uh, so I never really had to, get, to keep anyone off. What do you hope to bring to the role of the doctor? All the, every actor who's contributed to that aspect of the personality has brought their own um, unique something. What is the uh, Sylvester McCoy something likely to be? Eyebrows that go up and down all the time, I think. Um, well, I, I suppose in the humor, I bet they've all have brought their own kind of humor, but I'll bring my kind of humor. The humor, I think, will be more heightened because of me. Um, uh, it's mainly me that I'll be bringing. You'll have to find out who I am, really. And it's very difficult as, to talk about who I am because if I knew who I was, I most likely wouldn't be an actor. Well, because, uh, you know, people, I think people who really know themselves, you know, they don't do anything because they're quite satisfied. But those that don't kind of rush around saying, well, maybe I'm him. Maybe I'm Richard III. Or, uh, someone. In my opinion, it's really his acting ability that, that is the chief consideration. Um, added to being a marvellous actor, he is very zany, he is very eccentric, very quick-witted, which are certainly things that I want to capitalise on in the new series. Um, but principally, he's an excellent actor. We had something like 6,000 uh, British actors who were interested in, in playing the part. Inevitably, there has to be some sifting that goes on where you're looking at a, a look or a type. But he is so impressive. Um, in the British press, uh, people have been rather unkind and said that he's unknown. I mean, he is a most experienced actor. Um, he's done television, theatre, films, uh, lots of stage work. Well, I think the success of the show really is the constant change. Um, there have been, I think, ten producers and seven actors who played the part. And it is this constant change in format of the show. Um, subtle changes sometimes, sometimes major changes. And it's th those very, very changes that actually make the show uh, constantly appealing. Um, if you look back, as I'm sure you have, uh, at the very first episode of Doctor Who, the only two things that are, are remotely similar now are the police box and the signature tune, and even that's been update, updated several times. So I think it's a kind of constantly evolving show, a constantly evolving format, because of the fact that it, it has the, these very wide confines. Um, Dallas, for example, is a program about uh, people on a ranch and the oil industry. So inevitably, there's bound to be a certain repetition after a while. Um, Doctor Who's confines are time and space, and really they're both limitless. So there is this complete freedom. It's rather like giving an artist a, a completely blank canvas and saying, paint a picture. How long can the show go on? The Doctor allegedly only has 13 regenerations, and we're into seven Doctors. Yeah, I don't think you and I are going to be around to worry too heavily about it, but uh, it, remember that the Master reached a point where he was at the end of his final regenerative form, and we found a way uh, in order to give him a, an additional life and subsequently to be promised additional lives. Now, I think if we can do it for the, the baddie of the series, I see no reason why we can't find some reason for the goody to gain additional length of time. Producer John Nathan Turner, and of course, Dr. Number 7, Sylvester McCoy. Only just enough time to thank our special guests, Terry Nation and Pat O'Neill, for making this celebration of Doctor Who possible. Extra special thanks to BBC designer Ray Cusick for allowing us to share his personal photographs with you. 
And last but not least, thanks to you for supporting one of the most unique science fiction adventure series that the world has ever seen. For New Jersey Network, I'm Eric Luskin, hoping that you continue to enjoy Doctor Who, then and now. I was looking for leisure. When Whovians don't go away. Coming up next is the Bay Area's very first glimpse of the newest Doctor, Sylvester McCoy, in the Who movie Time and the Ronnie. But first, time out for a Whovian update. Have you done your part to add another piece to the puzzle? Phone now at 800-225-5454. And remember, Doctor Who depends on you. And the secrets that